All right, for those of us who are still here, uh, if you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 22, uh, we're going to be looking at a decent chunk of Scripture today, um, looking at verse, verses, or verse 22 through chapter 23, 11. So it's a lot that we're going to cover. Scott kind of brought us up to speed last week uh, with what was happening in the life of Paul, kind of the, the arc of the story and how things were well, being woven together, that, that God was, um, there were these, these different characters of Paul, the unbelieving Jews, and the Christians in the story, and, and how God was weaving these threads together to accomplish his purpose for spreading the church and drawing a people to himself. All right, so he previewed a little bit last week that Paul is going to be headed to Rome in what is the final act of Acts, right? That, that from now on, so starting with Paul's arrest in Acts 21, from here to the end of the book, Paul is no longer a free man. He's in Roman custody. Um, so in the, in the remaining chapters, we're going to see Paul standing before the succession of, of powerful men, proclaiming the gospel, sharing his testimony. Like, so we're going to hear Paul's testimony a couple more times as we walk through this book. And ultimately, he's going to end up on house arrest in Rome. And kind of that's where the, the narrative ends. We know that, um, kind of we know from his, some history, some of the things that went on after that. But that's the, that's the end of, of this book. So as, as we've done in the past with a little bit longer narratives, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray first, and then I'm going to read the text. And, and as I go through the text, and I hope this doesn't break it up too much, but it's kind of... For, in my mind, it's easier to do it this way than to go back and take, say all the things in a list. So as we go through the, the text, I'm going to stop and kind of share. So I'll try to tell you, well, if you're following along, you'll know when I'm not reading Scripture. So let's, let's pray and ask for God's help because I, I feel the need of it right now. Heavenly Father, I, I just come before you and I, I thank you um, once again for the opportunity to open your word. Lord, I thank you for what you have done in me through your word, and I pray that you would help all of us to receive this word and, Lord, to understand how we can apply it to our lives. Help us to, to focus our hearts and our minds in this time that we would, um, we would be leaning forward to hear from your Holy Spirit. Lord, and I pray that it would it would have lasting impact and change in our lives. Uh, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I, I'm going to read, and then I'm going to stop. And there's, it's going to be a few early at the beginning, and then we'll get some longer sections. So the first thing is, up unto this word, they listened to him. All right, so <laughs> I know we just got into this, but I gave you a warning. So here's the thing. It's, it's important to remember, if we're looking into this text, that what Paul has just said. So Paul's in the middle of a speech. He's in the middle of talking about his testimony. He's sharing, giving a defense for what he's about. And he's talking about how Jesus met him on the Damascus road. And then he gets into this part where he says, and Jesus told me to go to the Gentiles, right? I'm, some are, I'm paraphrasing here. So, so this whole miraculous story that he told, they were listening they were probably gritting their teeth, right? They're, they're a little bit like probably on edge, but they were being respectful. But the phrase that set them off was when he said, God spoke to him and told him to go to the Gentiles. This is a major affront to their anti-Gentile minds, right? So that's the first thing. All right, we're going to pick back up. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks, as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks. All right, so just a couple of cultural things. It's not certain exactly what the cloak throwing was a sign of. Some a couple commentators think they're kind of like it's it's like a, a we're getting ready to stone him. So some people might think that okay, this is a sign that we're so mad we want to stone you. Um, and it may be, uh, but it may be some other thing as well, just a sign of disgust. Throwing dust in the air was a sign that they were offended by what was just said. And so throwing dust is like trying to block the sound waves, kind of, if I, you know, to for whatever was just said. It's like, that's so offensive that we want to stop it from coming into our ears. Um, they were highly offended, obviously. 
Um, so it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's like a heavy sigh from a teenager, but a little bit more, right? Um, it's an obvious expression of displeasure and rejection of what has just been said. All right. So after that, I'll pick it back. The tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when, he had, but when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to flog a man who's a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came to him and, came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, but I'm a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. All right, so a couple things at play here in this little section. Paul gets tied up to be flogged. Now, this in itself is an, aff- is, is an offense for these people. We're going to see in a minute. So the, when it talks about the whips that they're used, these whips were flagella, like they're leather straps with like bones and rocks and stuff in them. Those whips were only to be used on slaves and non-citizens. So part of the thing that we don't necessarily pick up as we're reading it is just the process that they were doing. They bound him, and they were about to whip him like a non-citizen. So this is a big deal. Um, so this would not be acceptable for him to be flogged with this type of whip, much less without being charged. Right? So the laws at the time prohibited treating a Roman in this manner. And, and one, um, a quote from Cicero uh, said, To bind a Roman citizen is a crime. To flog him is an abomination. To slay him is almost an act of murder. So, so just the fact that they bound him in that moment they were already in hot water, potentially, right? It wasn't that they were about to do something that would put them, for, cer- for certain, if they continued with the flogging, they would have been in hot water. But just the fact that they bound him was not, um, not kosher. Um, so here's where Roman, Paul's Roman citizenship comes in handy. And, and at this point, it actually puts him in a more advantageous psychological position over the tribune. You know, it's interesting, he, the tribune paid for his, own, for his own citizenship. It was probably by a bribe. You know, a lot of times they would provide large sums of money and a bribe, and they would get citizenship. So when Paul points this out to the tribune, that he's a you know, Roman citizen, he is now under a greater deal of protection than he was before. All of a sudden, you know, this man realizes, I'm, I'm like, I'm just coming in to step this thing out, you know, to figure this thing out. And I was like, we'll just flog the guy. Maybe he'll shut up, calm down, and, and we'll be done with this. Let's just kind of put this thing away, right? I've got, I've got something to do later. Um, but then all of a sudden he realizes, and, and the, the switch flips. And he's like, oh, my goodness. I've got to take this in a whole different approach. So now Paul is under Roman protection as a citizen. And then we'll pick it back up. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to them, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you order me to be struck. Those who stood by said, Will you, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler among your people. All right, so a couple of things in this little section. So Paul starts off with saying, brothers right? I, I have lived my life before God in all conscience up until this day. The, this, this phrase, when he talks about living in good conscience before God was also received as an insult to the Jews who were there. They were, they were the ones who knew what God's desires for people were, right? And so in, in, in their, they're accusing Paul, 
And Paul's like, I've lived in clean conscience, and that just makes them indignant. Right? The Pharisees believed that it was through the purity of the people that the kingdom of God would arrive. Now, according um, to later Jewish tradition, one could only strike a Jew for the purpose of defending God's honor. So when Ananias, who, um, who by the way, Josephus later said that he had a quick temper and was insolent, um, when he ordered Paul struck, he probably thought he was defending God's honor. But it was, it was really out of anger and frustration that he ordered him struck. And, and I, the, it's, it's not... It's not clear exactly when you first read it, but the more I thought about it, the more I saw this. The, the irony of this is, here is Paul standing as a defender of God, one through whom God himself is speaking. The Holy Spirit, God, is speaking through Paul and sharing this gospel of the risen Christ, the Messiah, right? And so here he's telling about this and saying, I have a good conscience before God. And these fo- false I almost I was combined false and phony at the same time. These phony teachers who are supposed to be understand and know God, they think they're defending God by striking him. But the tr- truth of the matter is, no, God is not displeased. He is not offended by what Paul's saying. And so um, when, he, when he rebukes, I'm sorry, Paul's the only one there who's actually defending God's honor in this trial. So it was an unlawful command for them to do. So Paul rebukes them with those strong words that are reminiscent of Jesus' words to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, right? So his, his response is, as Paul, and, and I realize I'm kind of going fast here, um, as, as Paul is struck, right, they're like, you need to shut up. And he's like, hey, God's going God's gonna to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Right? He's, he's kind of reestablishing what the truth of the power dynamic is in this, in this kind of interchange. So Paul is recognizing that it is God who determines what's offensive. And God will defend his own honor. Incidentally, um, Ananias, a few years later, was killed by a zealot leader because of his Roman position. So like when Paul says this statement to Ananias, hey, God's going to deal with you, uh, he actually does. Um, so Paul calls out his hypocrisy. Essentially what he was doing, he was defending himself instead of, this, uh, Ananias was defending himself instead of defending God who had revealed himself through Christ. All right. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then came a great great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. What's what's interesting in this interaction is is that Paul is skillfully aligning himself with one of two sects that are present at this gathering. And then he pits them against one another. Right, so this causes these two groups to fight with one another, and even some of the Pharisees start standing up for Paul. If you see the dynamic in the story, you know, here's Paul, and he's got these two enemies who, right, you know, if, if you have a common enemy, then you're united. What's that, that? You know, if we have the same, but here's what he does. He goes and he finds the distinction between the two of them, points it out, and then all of a sudden they're fighting, and then some Pharisees are like, maybe he's not so bad at all, right? It was... <laughs> It's kind of, a, kind of an interesting thing. So, um, so as he points them off, like, and then all craziness breaks loose, right? So here's, here's this, and, and I, I realize as I'm doing this, this may not be the best way to go through it, but um, to stop, but uh, here's, here's what's going on, all right? So Paul's preaching, standing in front of these people, giving a defense, telling his testimony. When he gets to the part that says, God told me to go to the Gentiles, 
Pharisees and Sadducees lose their minds, right? Because they do not want that to happen. They do not want the Gentiles, right? So then there's this big fight so much that the, that the, you know, the establishment, the Roman government has to come in and, and try to figure this out. It's like when you show up in the front yard and you've got two kids fighting, right? And you don't know what's going on. You just need to go, all right, separate. What, what the heck is going on here? Tell me what's going on. So then they're all shouting and <laughs> And then as there, he's like, well, sorry. <laughs> Have you ever spanked a kid before you knew what was going on? That's probably what happened here. <laughs> Nobody wants to admit it. But so what's going on, he's like, all right, separate. I'm going to spank you both. And then we're going to sort this out, right? So, so that's kind of the, the picture what's, as chaos, right? All, all just people are shouting, things are going on. And this, this Roman, you know, um, Guy's just like, I, I just have to bring peace to this. I'll figure this out. Just whip that guy. Maybe it'll calm down. We'll get things sorted out. And then all of a sudden, this whole kind of, you know, gamesmanship thing unfolds. He realizes, oh, he's in more hot water. And then, and then Paul starts talking to the, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then they start getting mad at him, right? So, so then to end it all, he's like, all right, you go to your room. You guys calm down, like to bring it down to our, like, Paul, we just got to keep this guy safe because they're about to tear him to shreds. Right? I don't want a Roman citizen being torn to shreds on my watch. So we need to figure this out, and then tomorrow we'll bring him back and talk again. All right. So um, as this happens, um, and, and just in, in case you don't remember, here's some, as we think about uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, I've, I've said this a, a number of weeks ago, but in the, in the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there were four different sects that were kind of established in Israel. And each of them, um, so the, the sects were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, and the Essenes. And each of them have a different view of how the kingdom of God would be established. So they all had these different ideas. You know, the Pharisees believed that it was through purity. Like, when the people are pure, then the kingdom of God will come. The Sadducees were like, we're going to align ourselves with the Roman government. Also, um, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead or in angels or spirits. And they were pretty much like the mainline progressive denominations of the day, right? They're like, we kind of like this culture that we have, and we're Jews by birth. But we kind of don't, you know, we do the things, but we don't really believe it, um, we like the power that we have over people, right? So uh, they were also pro-Roman. They were anti-spiritual, but thought that religion was a good thing, right? Then the, then the Essenes believed that, like, we just need to go and hide out and wait for the kingdom to come. The Zealots are like, hey, we're going to bring it in in force. That's kind of the four. So we're dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees in this point. So Paul, what he does is he exploits this difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They believed in spirits and angels. And he exploits that difference. All right. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. All right. So from, from going through the text this way, which I'm not sure if I like that, um, I'm sure you can give me feedback, it's easy to see there's a, there's a ton of stuff going on here, right? There's a lot of cultural nuance, there's gamesmanship going on in this story in the sense that, that understanding the different views of the day kind of helps you understand how this is like a, a chess match in some ways and how Paul interacts with these people. It was, it was something that, that where Paul, as he navigates this, he's, he's as cunning as a serpent and as innocent as a dove. It's, it's pretty striking how, how savvy Paul is as he maneuvers his way through this experience. He knows how and he knows when to employ his knowledge of the laws and the customs of both the Jews and the Romans. Um, so it's like, this is, this is a crazy scene. Here's, here's where this could go. This sermon could go to say, all right, so what we need to do as Christians is we need to be fully aware of all the customs and the cultures that we're entering into so that we can wisely engage with them and then, and then counteract things, right? That could, be one, that could be one way that this would go, but I think it misses 
the point of this story. Paul is an apostle who has been called by God, who was one of the Pharisees who was trying to destroy Christianity. He was the one who had a permission to go and persecute Christians. He was the one who was standing there while the coats were being put at his feet as they were stoning Stephen. And this man's life has been dramatically changed by an encounter with the risen risen Lord. Christ came and knocked him off the donkey and said, hey, I've got a task for you. You are going to take my truth to the Gentiles. You are going to tell the people of who I am. And here this man who once had all the power to destroy this, now he becomes the one who is in some respects powerless against the the authorities of of the of the time. And so what's really going on in the story, in, in, in some respects, this is, this is a story about what it's like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It, it's about what it's like to be someone who goes into a culture, and, and it's almost like no matter what you say, you're going to be beaten down because people will reject the message of Jesus Christ. And it's a message about understanding what it was in Paul's heart that, that allowed him to stand there and to be, have the presence of mind through the help of the Holy Spirit to be able to navigate the situation with, I will say, fearful confidence. A fearful confidence as, you, as he's, I mean, I'm sure... As he's walking into this, as he's sharing his testimony, first of all, the boldness to stand up in front of people who have some authority, even if they don't have legal authority to take him out, there's enough people that they could take him out and face the consequences later, right? We'll, we'll ask forgiveness after we, you know, before we ask permission, right? But he is standing there looking at maybe not, maybe not some of his old friends, but the people who he used to align himself with and saying, I'm telling you this is true. I'm telling you this is what happened to me. The Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is the Messiah that we've all been looking for. You Pharisees and Sadducees, you all have your ideas about how the kingdom's gonna come about. I'm telling you the kingdom is here. And he came as a person, Jesus Christ. And as he's walking through this process, as I said, he kind of uses that navigation. But what we see here at the end, the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, take courage. For as you've testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. One of the things that... John's going to pick up this verse next week some, but I can, I can take something you said, like, just so that you know that I know that you <laughs> not to. But who, who needs to be told to take courage? Somebody who's kind of afraid. <laughs> oh, some of you were like, I need, can you tell me? Take courage, all right? <laughs> that helps. Paul, as he's going through this, we even read, if you look at Thessalonians, Paul, Paul says, I, much, in much fear and trembling, I was going through this. Paul is a man who, who looks on the outside, and it might be easy for us to go, well, he was Paul. He met Jesus face to face. Right? He had this experience on the Damascus Road. Like, he's, he's like a different level than me. But the truth of the matter is, Paul was a man who faced fear, and rightly so, in lots of situations. He was facing down fear for his life and for for his own body. You know, sometimes when I think about fear, I think about fear of dying. And like some people were like, hey, I'm ready to die for Jesus. And, and, you know, like, but here's the thing that we don't always think about. How about to get the snot beat out of you for Jesus and then have to go on living in the body that's broken because of it? How about the fact that he's got to take Luke with him on his journeys because Luke's a doctor and he can kind of patch him up and help him understand and help him like recover. 
Right? Imagine what Paul's body looked like. He said, I bear on my body the marks of Christ. This was a man who, I mean, we're not going to read it all, but he endured countless beatings, right? And we're going to see later where he's shipwrecked, and then he gets bitten by a snake. Like, it's bad enough. He went through the storm and all the chaos of that. Oh, am I going to drown? Drowning is like one of the scariest things, is it not? But then they're like, fine, we're good. Let's build a fire. Out jumps a serpent, bites him on the hand. Like, this man, has, has, he bears in his body the marks of Christ. And so he needs a man, he needs to have courage in this situation. So we as Christians are called to make disciples. We voted on our, our vision statement this past December. We are a group of people who, who make disciples, who walk with Christ in community, grounded in the word. Jesus' call to his disciples in, in the Great Commission is go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. Our call as Christians is to make disciples. And that's a process that, ex- that goes from, from pre-conversion through evangelism, through helping walk baby Christians into maturity. And that calls us, in, in order to do that, we must be willing to stand in front of people and, and courageously have confidence that the Holy Spirit will work in their hearts. So what I was wanted to ask as we, as we kind of look at this and close out, what was Paul's confidence in as he was standing before those people? Imagine, imagine what, it, what it's like, you know, I... To, to be standing before this crowd of people that can totally take your life. They, they, could, they could have it in a second. And it looked like, I mean, the guy's like, he's going to be torn apart. Get him to the barracks. I mean, I just, it's, it's amazing how, like, Acts is not written like a movie screenplay. Right? There's not a lot of like, oh, and then this guy, and then, and then like, they were, it was just kind of like, oh, and... He thought they were going to get torn apart, so he took them and put them in the barracks. It almost kind of reads like that. But the truth of the matter is this, is, this is an intense scene. This is an intensely terrifying scene for anyone. And Paul almost, like I said, with, with a, a, a fearful confidence is willing to stand before these people. And his confidence wasn't in his ability to navigate the cultural situations that were going on. His confidence was not in his ability to maneuver the Pharisees and the Sadducees against one another. The confidence that he has is the same thing that is the reason why he got there. He says, I, I am here on trial. I'm sorry, I want to find it. When Paul received, I'm sorry, brothers, I'm a Pharisee, son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and hope and with I'm sorry to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. When we think about who we are as believers and we think about what God has done and kind of our call to make disciples when you think about what it's like to to go and share your faith with somebody and you're like, well, I need a good strategy. I need a good way about, I need to learn some good words. I need to learn kind of a, a, a good apologetic. I would argue that Paul's apologetic was very simple. Christ is risen. We, we, we serve a Savior who has conquered death and lives. And the, the, the resurrection of Christ, without it, Paul says later in Corinthians, that, that without the resurrection of the dead, we're above all people to be pitied. And so the understanding of the resurrection of Christ is, is kind of the centerpiece of what, of what Paul's, the, the ground that Paul is standing on as he is speaking to these people. 
as he's sharing the gospel. All right. So here's, I'm going to try to bring this home. I realize, as, yeah, people tell me not to apologize, but I realize this is a little bit more scattered than normal. So for those of you who don't like me to apologize, I'm not sorry. For those of you who are confused, I apologize. As I said, there's a lot going on here, so it's hard to land this plane. Um, I'm going to try to make this practical. The hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's not just the ground for our evangelism. It's not just the, the starting place for us to share the gospel. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is every single day waking up in this body that we live in, right, that's starting to break down. I don't know about you guys, but 40 was like, man, it was a downturn. We had it. You're like, you're like, just wait. Is that what you're saying? Sorry. This is why we need an intergenerational church. So you guys can be like, oh, that's nice, Brian. You'll, you'll see. We had, we had an elders, uh, one day elders retreat Friday, and it's amazing the amount of time we talk about like our bodies and like how they're breaking down. But we live, we live in this world that is in, increasingly, to some extent or another, um, opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and we live in bodies, if you understand your flesh versus the spirit, we live in bodies who are fundamentally opposed to the, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, who crave things that we want, that our body wants, that it will think will make us happy. And so we're in this constant battle between our flesh and our spirit. When you wake up in the morning, you're in that battle. When you encounter a challenge, whether it's work or financial or relationship, family, all of those things are counters. They're they're reminders that this world, like we're in danger. This world is broken around us. And what do we have to say to our souls when we recognize the brokenness that is occurring in our world? I joke about the body, but I, I know that those of you who, are, who are, have suffered physically or have people that you know who are suffering with health concerns, that's a major concern for people. But it goes beyond that. When you have relationships fall apart and you look at it and you go, what, what is their hope in here? What is the hope for this resol- resolution or reconciliation? If you're looking at your finances and you're going, I don't know how I can get out of this. If you're looking at all of those things, it's not, Jesus isn't the answer to all those things in the sense that he will fix all of those things. Jesus is the answer in the sense that you look at it and you go, my only hope in life and death is Jesus Christ and his resurrection. The fact that our king reigns helps us to walk through whatever trash we have to go through in our lives and understand that he will be with us. Take courage. As you've testified about me, the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Here, the God of the universe is speaking to Paul's heart to take courage because he's living. Because he reigns. Because at the end of the day, there is, there is no better place for Paul to be than in right relationship and standing with the risen Christ. That's the place that he needs to be. He is exactly just like the, when the Hebrews walked through the middle of the parted waters in, as they were leaving Egypt. That might have been terrifying. But you know what? There's no safer place for them to be than right where God has them in that moment. Because he lives, he has risen, he has spoken to you through his word, and he will speak to you through his spirit as you study his word. All right. So take courage as you go through your life. The the risen Savior is with you. If you, are, if you are in Christ, you are his. And there is nothing that you will walk through 
that he is not sovereign over, and that he will not be with you in the midst of it. If you're not a Christian today, I, I, would, I would say you, you need to wrestle with the fact that you, if, if, where, where is your salvation? What, what rocks are you standing on? What, what is the foundation that is going to sustain you through the trials and challenges of this life? If it's not Jesus Christ, if it's not the risen Savior, you're, you're like Paul without citizenship here. There's, there's, no, there's no help. But if, if the Holy Spirit is prompting your heart, if you're realizing, if you're looking at your life and you're saying, I don't have hope. I don't have a fearful courage when it comes to life, when it comes to, to my future, to my eternity. I would, I would plead with you to respond to that. But the finished work of Jesus Christ is what allows us to have that confidence that he took your sin on the cross. He stood in your place, taking the wrath of God upon himself to atone for your sin so that you could have right relationship with God and that you could have a place where you can stand in the midst of chaos like this, like Paul did, and understand, I am... I am completely secure because God has me right where he wants me. The risen Savior is protecting me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. And Lord, I just ask that you would take um, these words, which at times even feel scattered for me. And, and Lord, just encourage your people. Lord, encourage us to trust completely in you, in your finished work, in the ways that you have worked in our lives. Lord, as we face the challenges of our life, as we face the the difficulties and the trials, Lord, that we would have a, a, a confirmed, even fearful confidence that you are sovereign that you are good and you are God, and you went through the most difficult and challenging trial that anyone could have walked through. You you took the punishment for our sins on the cross. Jesus, you you have taken in yourself the wrath that was for us. Lord, and you did that gladly so that we might have a right relationship with you, that we might have confidence and peace in the midst of trials. Lord, do a work in us. I pray that you would regenerate hearts this morning, that you'd be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.